Hello, and welcome to Alaska Book Week 2024. My name is Carol Sturgelewski. I've been a writer and editor in Alaska for over 40 years, and I'm a board member of Alaska Center for the Book, which is Alaska's affiliate with the U.S. Library of Congress Center for the Book. Today, we're hosting a discussion on writing the hard stuff, sharing stories of grief, trauma, and healing. I think one of the most difficult things for a writer to tackle is grief. Adventure, romance, physical description, dialogue, all of those have their challenges. But when it comes to writing about the pain of a dysfunctional family, substance abuse, physical and mental anguish, the loss of a loved one, it's really hard. I've seen writers walk away from projects because they are too intimidated to bear their own grief or that of someone that they love. Many people deal with this on a personal level through counseling or therapy or their faith, but taking a step beyond personal healing to share and write painful stories and give them to the rest of the world, that's hard, but it's a necessary part of writing. I think it's a necessary part of life. So today we're talking with two Alaskans who have made that leap of faith, who share their stories and encourage other writers to not be intimidated when telling these difficult stories. Marion Elliott is author of Out of the Dark, a memoir dealing with the death of her son, the end of her marriage, and uprooting her life to move to rural Alaska. Matt Komatsu is the author of, I'm sorry, Matt is an editor for the journal War, Literature, and the Arts. He founded Danger Close Alaska in 2016, helping veterans and active military build community through writing. He's also an award-winning author, currently serving veteran of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and works with writing therapy programs for TBI patients at J. Bear. Neither of you started out to be a writer. What brought you here and what brought you to this topic? Matt, why don't you kick us off? Um, yeah, sure. So um, I was always interested in writing um, when I was younger and uh, kind of did it on again and off again. Uh, interestingly enough, um, when I was at the Air Force Academy, um, I had the opportunity to take a creative writing class, uh, which is probably the last place that you'd ever think you'd um, get a chance to do creative writing. But I got to do a full semester with uh, Professor Donald Anderson, and uh, it definitely <clears throat> it definitely lit a spark. Um, but I struggled for a really long time trying to evaluate like. All right, what to write about, how to write about things, like what makes my story special. All the typical um, neuroses I think that, that writers face when they go to the page. And, uh, you know, at some point, I think um, right around after uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, started to see a large production of that are produced literature about the wars in Iraq, um, which got me really interested in sort of a, a wider, broader work, or a wider body of work. So started to go back and read the other things. Um, and of course, you know, all, all paths to reading about war will eventually lead through uh, Tim O'Brien, things they carried, going after Cacciato and things like that. And uh, I had a really hard time because when I looked at it, I felt like most of the things that I was seeing were sort of first person combat narratives. You know, there's always sort of a, uh, an adventure story, a coming of age story in the middle of all of it. Um, and at some point, you know, the, the protagonist had to uh, undergo some massive challenge and come out the other side. And my experience at war was not like those other stories. And so I didn't really see anything that was like mine and didn't feel like I had permission for it. Um, my 2012 deployment to Afghanistan was, uh, it turned out to be pretty eventful and put me in the middle of some of those traditional type of combat narratives. And so after that, I finally said to myself, well, okay, I've got something to write about. Um, 
And so that was really kind of the genesis of it. Um, I ended up writing a, a first person essay for the New York Times. There was an editor there at the time named Jim Dow, who was had a column there where he would publish first person, uh, first person narratives uh, from veterans um, quite openly. And so Jim gave me the opportunity to run it. Um, and that sort of cracked the door open after I got that essay published. Um, I realized I really enjoyed it. I really wanted to do more uh, and came to the MFA program at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And uh, when I was there, that was kind of when I really started grappling with the idea of like, what types of stories do you get to tell? And as I read more broadly um, and got exposed to more, I, I got a whole lot more comfortable exploring the margins of um, what is possible in conflict uh, related writing. Okay. Miriam, what's your story? Okay, so this is a story of how I came to writing as opposed to how I wrote this book. Nice. And I spent my working years not as a writer, as a teacher. Um, I taught Montessori school first, and then when I came to Alaska after a while, I taught the early grades. I did a lot of writing of reports, evaluations, grants, lots and lots of grants, but not creative writing. That didn't happen until some time after I had retired. And there was a lot of reality TV that my grandchildren were watching back in Philadelphia and calling me regularly because it just sounds so outlandish to them. And my son convinced me to start a blog where I would write about what living off the road system in Alaska really looked like. And I enjoyed that, but it was just, you know, off the cuff kind of writing. There wasn't really any kind of science to it. It was more like just writing a letter. So when it came to the point where I decided I was going to write this book, I realized I needed to get more um, creative writing knowledge behind me how to go about putting a book together, um, finding a story arc, things like that. And I joined a writing workshop. And that's how I got into writing. In that writing workshop, um, Sarah Birdsall, who was a teacher, um, encouraged me to enter one of my stories in the Anchorage Daily News Writing Contest. And it won first place. <laughs> I thought it was a waste of time entering it, but she was convinced it was a good story. So that more or less told me, yeah, I probably could write. I just needed to get to work at it. So, yeah. So both of you have started, from what I understand, Marion, Out of the Dark is a memoir of events that started decades ago. Correct, right? yes. Had you been writing or thinking about that, processing that all those years, or um, was it something that you needed all that time? So, yeah. so really and truly, all that time when people would hear about my story, they would say, you should write a book. And I never really took it as anything more than a figure of speech just their way of saying that's a very interesting story. I also never really considered it because I couldn't imagine putting down on paper all about myself. It wasn't until probably around 2018 or so, uh, three or four different events, one right after the other, got me to move from the you should write a book to I should write a book. And uh, I can tell you quickly, the, the first one was a close friend lost her son in a snow machine accident. And when I went to console her, because I knew from past experience, just being with someone, if they know you've been had the same experience, it's it's a bit of a relief because they don't have to explain. 
they know you know. Her reaction was very different than I expected. She wanted to know what was wrong with me, how I could be still standing, why I wasn't totally destroyed. And it wasn't something I could explain to her in that situation, but that got me thinking, if I could tell my story, it could be helpful. She thought there was no way life would ever be better, that she would always be in that terrible state. And by telling my story, people can see, no, it changes, you know? And that was followed by somebody very, very close to me losing her son. And her reaction was total despondency. She didn't see any reason, you know, life didn't make any sense anymore. Her son was gone and there was nothing else to consider. And it was, again, a question, well, yeah, you can eventually have a fulfilling life. It's not always going to be as empty as it is at the moment. And then there were other stories. I'm, I don't need to go into all of them, but I got to the point where I realized if I could just say what happened for me, people could see that in the end, you can go on. You can find a way to deal with your grief. You can have a fulfilling, happy life just by telling what happened to me. So, yeah. Matt, are, are these themes things that pop up in, in your work with uh, in the veterans community, um, this idea that writing can be healing, can be useful to other people, or is it just the focus first on yourself to heal? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I, in what I've encountered, um, within the veteran writing space um, or conflict writing space, uh, I think what Marion brings up is, um, is, is quite common, right? Like this idea that in telling our own stories, uh, we can help other people uh, to understand um, and potentially to navigate, you know, some of these processes. So, yeah, I think um, it, it's really, it's really common that when I encounter somebody who actually wants to take up a long-term, you know, project, um, especially with uh, within the veteran space, um, because the you know the nature of military service is you know heavily centered around that last word, right? Um, and so I think that there is still a spirit of service that comes with that, even if the veteran is no longer serving, um, where they believe that uh, there's an opportunity there to, to help somebody else. And I mean, I will tell you that um, having to, you know, separate from Marion's side in terms of navigating the, the process of grief, um, you know, I think it would have been super helpful for me to have been exposed to more of like the non-traditional ways of helping navigate just military service, right? Um, because the, the stories that sort of get the most air um, within um, the war writing space, really up until uh, Phil Cly wrote Redeployment, um, were really focused on all the first person sort of combat type narratives. And so it was a whole lot harder to find, a whole lot harder to hear about, you know, these other stories that explored uh, other experiences on the margins of the veteran experience that that could be helpful. I think since Phil's book came out, um, it has, I think that book gave a whole lot more people permission to pursue ideas about war writing uh, on the page, for sure. So we always hear that there there is no timeline for grief. Um, and Matt, you, um, got yourself on a military aid force to Japan in 2011 to help with the um, uh, recovery from the, the huge tsunami in which your grandmother died. And then 
what, eight or nine years later, you wrote about that uh, in a in a Pulitzer uh, grant project. Um, and as I said, Marion, there was there was a huge amount of time. So is it do you need that time? Do you need to step back and let those thoughts percolate or can you, were these things that you were writing about a little bit all along here and there and um, and saving for that, that perfect moment? Sometimes you just have to be in the right mood to write the right thing. Marin, why don't you go first? Cause I think, I think you and I will probably have two different approaches on this. Okay, yeah. sure. Yeah, so in my case, um, grief was something that took a very long time to get in its place. And by that I mean, grief is always there, as you said. Um, and learning to see it coming, those moments when it's raising up and grabbing hold of you, and knowing how to keep it in its place, um, recognizing it um, takes a long time. In the early days, I never could have written this book. I needed to get up to the point where I was able to actually talk about the situation without having that pain take over. You know, the, the lump in the throat, the ache in the arms, the difficulty that comes with it. Um, and it took a very long time for that to happen. I wouldn't have been able to write it early. And so I never really thought about the story, putting together something to write um, until really those situations occurred and it became a compelling thing to do. It got past it got me past the feeling that I can't talk about this, I can't talk about myself, I can't talk about my grief. And you need a very compelling reason to get you past that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think it's important to, um, it's important to acknowledge like, the, the types of grief uh, that we're potentially dealing with here. So, you know, what Marion is talking about um, in the loss of a son and what I'm, the topics that I've typically covered, um, I would I would say that, you know, Marion's um, very raw, like very, very personally, you know, connected um, to that. Um, when it came to my Japan story, there was a, there was grief that was certainly involved in it. Um, but I think for me, because I had been so essentially growing up in the United States, completely disconnected from my Japanese uh, side and my Japanese family, the inability to communicate with them, like there was some grief there. But I, I think what I ended up settling on was a much different uh, sense of what that grief was over um, versus, you know, what I think we would traditionally think is the loss of a family member. Right. Well, I think. Marion's got the loss of the family member pretty well covered with her story. For me, my grief was, uh, as I as I came to understand it more, was less over, um, it, there was certainly grief for the loss of my grandmother, for uh, extended family, and for uh, the affected Japanese and the north on the northeast coast in general. Um, but there was also a tremendous sense of loss in terms of uh, what, what, all these things, all these stories, right? All these connections to uh, fifty percent of my ancestry that disappear in the blink of an eye, right? Um, and so, for me, sort of approaching that book has been a uh, has been a rebuilding process. I.e., I can't unwind the clock. I can't do anything about that. But what has changed in me? in that time and what am I capable of rebuilding uh, in the wake of all that? I do also want to bring up too that, you know, the timelines for grief um, are, are so highly individual, right? Um, 
you know, you know in both Marion and my, um, my, both of our paths, I think, have been long and considered, right? Uh, and like Marion said, she had to arrive at a place where it felt like uh, this was the time to do that. Um, and so, yeah, mm -hmm. I think one of the one of the things I always try and bring up with um, with people within the the writing space is um, there can be writing that you do as therapy. Uh, and there can be writing that you do as art. Um, and then there can be writing that is both uh, therapeutic and artistic. And I think it's difficult to strike that balance between the two. Um, and if what you really want to do is produce art, um, you need time. Um, and you need separation from the events to, uh, to digest, uh, to transition, and to build, you know, your individual understanding of it. Because that's, you know, that's what that's what we want to be able to convey on the page is sort of what has changed within the narrator throughout this process. And if you're still like in the middle of that horrible, horrible place of grief, right? Like Marion was saying with his friends who are just like, how can you still be standing? Like life is over. There's nothing left. Um, it, it would be, you know, completely impossible um, to, to put anything down on the page that uh, would be, you know, I think necessarily a value to uh, somebody else. Uh, but by the same token, like there is a therapeutic aspect to putting those things down on the page, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing that we always always have to remember as writers is that, okay, that felt good to put down on the page. Now let me take the next 15 years to turn it in, in into the story that I want. Yeah, so you're absolutely right about the timeline for grief. Um, particularly um, if you lose someone you love. And particularly, I think, if you're a parent that loses a child. Um, that really is a traumatic injury to the brain. And the brain in the early days is so disrupted. Um, you, get, you have a sense of disassociation sometimes. Uh, your sensory input is really, really change. Things are louder, colors are brighter, light, lights are sharper. Um, you deal with excessive adrenaline all the time because there's always that fight or flight. You want the whole thing to go away. And you feel that as, you know, muscular pain, sort of like a, a flu, um, which goes along with the pain. You actually feel a pain in your heart, grief is a, at that point, a very physical thing because it's a physical injury. Well, just like, you know, if you break your leg, you have to give it time to heal. With this kind of traumatic injury to the brain, you need to give it time to heal. And if the, for everyone, it's going to take different amounts of time. But most of the people I know who have this experience, it's a good year or two for just the initial healing. Then there's the following healing of coming to face what happened and how you're going to live with it. So you're right, it takes a very long time. I never could have written it a long time ago. So, yeah. So Matt, this this idea of, of first therapy and then um, moving into art is this something that you use when you're working with folks in the in the writing therapy program um so my experience so far is uh i haven't been exposed to anybody who uh, is looking you know to do uh, a longer term or commit to a longer term uh, uh, writing project um but it, it's a it's certainly something that i would approach uh, with anybody who indicates that it, is okay let's 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 work on some things right like when i when i when i'm in the therapeutic space i really want to focus on the therapeutic aspect right and, and just the simple act of putting words on a page you know the the science is is growing more established on how that rebuilds you know neural pathways and induces physical changes in the body um and all those kinds of things so i really just want to I want to be in that moment, um, in that in that that therapy space. 
but typically after if somebody comes back and says, Hey, you know, I really enjoyed this. I want to do something more, then we're going to say, all right, well, let's, let's have a different discussion outside this space, um, about how you can actually do that. So on a, on a technical aspect, how did you, or how do you suggest people get into the mindset of writing about these difficult things? I, I, worked with one author who who you know wrote several chapters skipped over the hard part he just kind <laughs> of found it and then went back and kind of filled it in um uh, how do you say okay today i'm going to sit down and i'm going to write about yeah the the substance abuse in my family and how that affected me as a child you know it's like Okay, pencil that in. Um, how do you, how do you discipline yourself, um, Marion? You want to try that one? Well, when I got to the point, and by the way, my picture isn't coming up. Is there something wrong with that? I see you. Oh, okay. I don't see me on the screen. I just see you. So, um, when I got to the point where. Um, I was actually going through the process of sitting down and writing. And this is after a number of other things that had to happen. Um, you're right. I wasn't able to get focused on it. Um, first of all, just daily life would be getting in the way all of the time. Um, it wasn't until I joined a writing workshop and that made all the difference because now I had to have those eight to 12 pages every week when I went to my writing workshop class. And true, sometimes I'd be up late the night before trying to get it done, but that's the kind of outer uh, push or control or discipline that I needed to have um, because nothing else worked for me. Uh, making a plan to do it at a certain time or uh, make it a priority or these other ways that people have of staying focused didn't work for me until I joined that writing workshop and that changed everything. Um, through that, I was able to get enough down so that then the narrative became the focus and I was constantly pushed to get to it so that I could fix it and improve it and get to the next point. But initially, I would suggest a group, a writing workshop group that worked for me. Yeah. So. Matt, what about you? Yeah, I, I think Marion's absolutely right. Like the community is super helpful on that. Um, and so, go ahead. Are are there are there times when you know someone says no, we need more imagery on this scene where um where your husband is coming at you with a knife give us more detail and you just want to go i can't do well, this yeah so we through that i i had that all the time because it was a writing workshop so i would bring what in what i was writing and people would give their comment um the biggest problem for me was the suggestions on how I could, you know, maybe give more imagery or somehow hype it or whatever. And it was like, but that didn't happen. I'm writing a memoir here. You know, that's totally made up. Yes, if I was writing a novel, uh, perhaps it would sound better. Um, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying very hard to write what happened. Um, Robert Lowell wrote about that in his poem epilogue, that if you just write what happened, you can let the reader see the light. If I then, you know, confused it with all of these suggestions from people, it wouldn't be the truth. And then what kind of light would they see? It really wouldn't be worth it. So that was difficult, yes. And I would just always explain, but that didn't happen. No, so yeah. 
Yeah, I think, um, and Marion and I have been in a workshop together. Um, yes. He's heard my <laughs> spiel on, you know, part of the navigating workshops is learning what to pick up and, and what to discard, you know, in your own process. And finding your own voice is, is a part of that workshop um, process. Carol, back to the, the things that help, I think, um, I always just go back to the books. You know, my first question for anybody who's writing is, what are you reading, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, uh, I, I think it holds true in any case, right? Because we turn, we turn to reading for examples, but I think what we miss sometimes is that uh, the things that we read are also, they can inspire us, right? They can challenge us. Um, and so, you know, for somebody who's in the middle, so say person X, you know, has lost a son or a daughter, right? Um, and they read Marion's book, then that could potentially be uh, inspirational to them uh, in terms of challenging themselves to cover the, the difficult parts, um, things to think about on the craft side. You know, there's so many there's so many ways that the reader that a reader can come to a book and, and find unexpected things within those books that uh, encourage them to keep going. Um, and so I think, you know, in addition to what Marion talked about for community, um, that books are our friends. And, you know, if you're having a hard part or if you're having a hard time writing about some story or, or an aspect of the story, then find other people uh, who met those same challenges and, and see how they navigated those uh, in their works. Which is what you do in your veterans writing community, <clears throat> finding other people to share their stories and, and see how they're, they're handling it. That brings me to something that Marion and I talked about uh, a little while ago. And that is this cultural conditioning. Yes. <laughs> as oh don't talk about that and i know in the in the you know in the military in different um different cultures different i don't know anyway what i'm trying to get to say is there is this mindset that we don't talk about those things um, we don't share those those things. Real men don't say that. Um, tough it up. Um, you can handle this. Come on, I know you've mm -hmm. got it. So how do you deal with especially family and close friends saying, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with you talking about this? Marion, why don't you go since we've... Yeah, we so... Yes, yeah. so... My friends and family were all very supportive of it. Um, that wasn't the problem. The problem was the cultural conditioning that you referred to. I grew up in an Irish ghetto in Brooklyn, New York, where it was very clear that you never talked about yourself. And I picked up on it listening to people talk about people who talked about themselves and how all they have to do is talk about themselves. There was a real disdain for it, uh, particularly if it was sad. My grandmother would um, label them, Miss Pity, Poor Me. Here comes Miss Pity, Poor Me again. So the conditioning that you don't use the self-referential eye was very, very strong. And it is true in many cultures, not just the Irish culture, the native culture, I have a good friend who's an Aliu person who has the very same strong feeling about not talking about herself, about her family. Um, Viet Nguyen, and I hope I said his name correctly, he won a Pulitzer for his book, The Sympathizer. He talked about growing up as a Vietnamese and the fact that his family never talked about anything that happened in their house outside of their house. And it was very difficult for him because he wanted to write his memoir, but he couldn't do it because he couldn't talk about himself. He finally settled on writing his memoir in second person because as he explained it, that allowed him to let someone else tell the story for him. 
And in my case, I wrote it in third person because that would allow me to be talking about a different person. Even though it was me, it was this other person named Jean, who was really kind of like a generic Marion. And so standing in for just about any other parent who had lost a child. When I first sat down to try to write it in first person, because that's the rule, you put a memoir in first person, it was just under terrible ag agitation. Um, and then when I'd get something done, I couldn't stand the sound of it. And I'd have to start over. It was Sarah Birdsall who told me I should try third person. And it was completely different. Taking this other person to stand in for me and write the story that way was easier. And that's how, you know, I was able to get it down. But as far as in my case, friends and family, they were all very supportive. A few of them wanted me to change their name. But other than that, they were pretty much, you know, happy with what I wrote. Mm -hmm. So. And man, I know you have, have talked about the challenge of writing about other people who have been through traumatic experiences, but telling that story with respect. And um, have, you, have you run into challenges where, you know, no, don't talk about that or say yeah. this, but... Yeah, I, you know, I think for me, um, so when I spent time in Japan uh, speaking to survivors of the tsunami, um, I think what I ended up uh, settling on, and I, I, I had some good advice from uh, from some friends on that. So uh, my friend Brian Kastner has written a bunch of books, and he's spent time in uh, conflict zones um, and uh, pandemic hotspots spots and things like that and at one point you know you end up having a crisis uh, as a writer or a journalist in terms of the way that you're telling the story and you know starting to feel like you're just exploiting it and all these kinds of things and I think uh, all those things are, are normal uh, the the best thing you can do is remember that these people are sharing their stories with you because uh, you have told them you want to write about them, right? So they, in the journalistic space, then you, you've you been given permission to do it. Um, but I think it's a good moral compass to have the idea in your head that you need to um, respect their story, um, which is their story and not yours, uh, to the maximum extent possible, right? And so. I think it's good if you are writing about somebody else's traumatic uh, narrative uh, and you're questioning your ability to uh, to do it justice, right? Like you, if you are not questioning um, your ability to do it justice, then I think you're potentially in dangerous territory there. Yeah. It's not about you. It's about the person you're writing about. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think we're drawing close to the end of our time, but I wanted to ask if if either of you are have a new writing project. Um, what's coming up? Possibly. I guess that's the best way I can say it. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it's not so much a spoiler alert. I was looking at the possibility of taking my blog, which is stories about living off the road system, and, and turning it into a book. Um, the thing is, I don't really have, I haven't been able to find a compelling theme for it. So I'm still, you know, going back and forth about it. What it is, it's just a very nice collection of anecdotes about how nice it is to live in a cabin, you know, um, which might be nice for my family, but, but other than, than that, I don't really know. Yeah. That doesn't mean something won't come up. Yeah. Matt, how about yourself? Oh, yeah. I have, I've always got like 80 irons in the fire. Um, so over the past couple of years, I've done more and more uh, writing about fly fishing. Um, oh. And so that's been 
uh, that's been kind of grabby for me. Um, so uh, just looking for opportunities to continue to do, uh, you know, fly fishing adjacent writing um, mm -hmm. uh, has been a lot of fun. And of course, the good news is it takes me to the river. <laughs> so it's it. Yeah, it's a good reason to be on the river. Um, oh, dear. Yeah, I'm also, uh, so my agent is in the process of submitting a, a book proposal for my post uh, Japan tsunami memoir. So that could turn into something um, as well. And then uh, uh, over the past couple of years, gotten into uh, the fiction side of things with uh, a co-creator uh, working on uh, graphic novels and things like that. Uh -huh. So yeah, the answer is I got, <laughs> I always have like 50 unfinished pots on the stove for sure. Do, do either of you have any any clothing closing thoughts for people who might be listening to this um wanting to get started on their own project um i think we've covered some things like making you know making sure you have a writing community for feedback but any other any other thoughts i think um i think probably what i would say is that in the end, you will find that it was a very worthwhile thing to do. That you may start with hesitation. Why are you bothering? Is this really going to be important? But do it. You know, if it comes up, do it. Because in the end, you will find great satisfaction from it, I think. And After all the those stories are important to tell. Um, and it's important for other people to hear them. And um, there's an Irish writer, I think his name is Colin McCann. He said he has this what he calls bus theory. If you don't get it down on paper and you're always planning to do it sometime in the future, the day will come when you'll step off the curb in front of a bus and it will never get down. So do it, sit down. As he said, put your arse in the seat and put it on paper. So do it. You'll find that you're happy that you did, so. I uh, I would definitely echo what Marion is saying and because I'm always uh, looking for practical things um, for people. Uh, regardless of what it is that they're trying to do is uh, specifically, you know, with relevancy to this panel is uh, put it down on paper and it doesn't have to be good uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, complete or anything, but just start putting it down on paper and nobody else ever needs to see it. Right. Um, and I think to go back to what Marion says, you will find that it is helpful uh, to simply have those things down on paper, uh, whether it's in the moment and the, and the part of a therapeutic journey, uh, whether it's considering a longer term, you know, artistic project down the road, um, or, uh, you know, at, at some point, um, you know, family are going to want to know your story, right? And it can be helpful uh, to have these things down on paper when we are sharing and passing down stories from generation to generation. Uh, even if the intent is to lock it away, uh, put it uh, next to the will and say, read this, you know, after I'm gone, at <laughs> least then like the stories are not lost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, we within the Western world, we are not a culture of oral tradition in which stories get passed down from generation to generation. And we lose a lot of that. Um, a lot of that generational knowledge uh, disappears because uh, there is nothing on which those stories are preserved. So, yeah, I just encourage people to, to hang in there, put it down. You don't have to share, um, but put something down on paper and see what happens. Yeah, you know, I had been a little concerned that this panel might be a bit gloomy, but I 
oh my gosh, I want to run in and sit down in front of my desk and <laughs> start to work. Um, I think this has been a really encouraging conversation. And I thank both of you for that. And that's why Alaska Center for the Book wanted to do this panel was to encourage writers to be brave enough to explore the hard stuff and uh, work through this the healing that can can come for this. So I really appreciate both of you sharing that. Um, if you're watching this and you would like to learn more about uh, Matt and Marion's work, <clears throat> You can find them at uh, Marion is out of the dark um, and Matt is over at Matthew And you can learn more about Alaska Center for the Book and Alaska Book Week at Alaska Center for the Book.org. So thank you both for coming and um, sharing sharing your stories. Well, thank you for having us, Carol.